Did you know that if you lost 10 pounds of fat, eight and a half pounds of that would be expelled in the form of CO2 from the lungs? Did you know that the reason why you might be waking up in the middle of the night to pee is not necessarily because you drank too much water. It might be because you're breathing through your mouth. Did you know that mouth breathing might have some influence on anxiety, stress, ADHD, poor immune function, and a host of other issues? This week, we are talking about breath by James Nestor. This is a phenomenal book, and I've been dying to talk with you about it and tell you some of the own, my own experiments that I've been doing on myself that were inspired by this book Breath is something that is super important. It has tremendous implications for our health and our well being, both in the moment and long term for the rest of our lives. So I can't wait to start the conversation with you and see where it goes. Welcome back to Jab and Flow here on the Street Parking Podcast channel. Now, We've been doing this every week. This time, I really mean it. This time, it's super important. Start with a couple of breaths. If you can, close your eyes. Make sure you're sitting up tall. Close your mouth. Take a slow breath in through your nose. Feel the air going in. Feel your belly expanding. And breathe out through your nose. Pause at the bottom of that exhale. Slow breath in through the nose. Pause at the top. Relax your shoulders. Out through the nose. One more time. Slow breath in. Fill your belly. When it can't expand anymore, fill your chest. When it can't expand any more, lift your chest. Hold it at the top. And then the slowest exhale from your nose that you can make. Blink your eyes open. And here we are. The breath is... A crazy thing. And what we're going to do this week is book club. So I've been reading, you know, I'm always reading like four or five different books, reading slash listening to. And I get messages from folks. They're wanting to know what it is that I am reading. And honestly, I read a lot of stuff. Some of it I am not so sure how I feel about it, but I read it anyways. I think it's important to to know and learn. Some things I really feel like I can get behind and I get super excited about. And that's the stuff that I want to make sure that I share. So for this book club episode, we are talking about breath. Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art by James Nestor. I started this book a little while back, couldn't really put it down. It's extremely compelling, and I am kind of feel like I've read it a couple of times, but cover to cover one time, and then a lot of like scanning and looking and rereading other parts that I found interesting, parts that I had highlighted. And I'm not going to just summarize the book here. I highly recommend. We'll go ahead and say that one of the action items for this week is to read this book. It's so fascinating. But I am going to share with you a couple of points that I takeaways, you know, that I really found to be important and relevant to the street parking community, to the fitness community, and to just people that are alive in this world right now that I think this is um, would be important stuff to know. So breath. Here's a fun fact. When you breathe in, more molecules of air 
will pass through your nose than all the grains of sand on the world's beaches. Think about all the grains of sand on the world's beaches. You get more molecules of air into your body with one breath than that. Sounds like a lot. Sounds like a lot. But then if we break down what is in the air. So the air that we breathe is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and like 1% other stuff. Neon, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide, hydrogen. So the stuff that we use is oxygen. And only about 21% of the air that we breathe in is even available for us to use. Now, only 20 to 25% of that oxygen that we breathe in gets absorbed into the body and used for the various processes for which it's needed. So when every, every breath in that you take, the air that you breathe in, four to 5% of that air is actually being used by your body. So with that small of a percentage of the air that we are breathing in, it should be extremely important that we make sure that we are breathing effectively so that we can make the most out of that oxygen that we are getting. I did, when I was reading this book, he talks about the importance of breathing through the nose and a lot of the hazards that go along with breathing from the mouth. Now, I took this to the extreme and I decided that for 30 days, I was going to do nasal breathing only in every single one of my workouts. And the types of workouts that we do are not just aerobic, there's anaerobic components to it. And it's very, very difficult to do high volume weightlifting exercises and not breathe through the mouth. It's very difficult to be explosive over a, the course of many reps and not breathe through the mouth. But that's what I did. And I want to share with you some of the results that I got from that. First things first. I went slower. I went slower. If we are deciding that our fitness level is determined by how fast we can do a workout in, by how much we work we can do in a fixed amount of time, or how much the time it takes to do a fixed amount of work, well, then me breathing through my nose makes me less fit. And I know that that is not the case. But for all the people that want to use that as an excuse for not breathing through the nose, let's just get that out of the way. Yes, I went slower in my workouts and I performed less work in more time during those workouts. Now, I felt extremely good during the workouts. Once I got into the nasal breathing, I felt extremely good after the workouts. My recovery was so much noticeably better when I was doing nasal breathing in my workouts. It's, it's not even a question. My sleep was better. Um, I did not wake up in the middle of the night to pee when I made sure that I was breathing through my nose at night. And I'll explain to you why that happens. But because my, back to the workouts, because I feel like I was able to perform better and feel better during and after the workouts and recover better in between workouts, I was able to be more consistent. I was able to be more consistent. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but after the first like five days, 
when I was the first five days of doing this experiment, I was not able to nasal breathe for the entire workout. At some point I would lose it and I would start breathing through my mouth. And as soon as that happened, even though it felt like, oh, finally, this big, delicious gulp of air is coming in. It's going to save me. After a couple of those breaths, all of a sudden, I would get tired. I'd get shaky. Um, and it became a real struggle to complete the workout compared to a few days later when I was able to nasal breathe through the whole workout. And I felt like it was just really smooth. Um now, oh man, I'll come back to that in a second. So, uh, oh yeah. So once I got to where I could breathe through my nose for the entire workout, I want to say I went like 10 or 11 days without a rest day. And I wouldn't recommend doing that, but I just felt so good in my body that every day I was able to get after a workout still finish within the goal time. So I knew I was getting the appropriate stimulus. I was just maybe going like RX versus, you know, maybe normally I, I tend to go a little bit more RX plus. So, and in generally I was going a little bit lighter weight than um, doing heavier weight. But the outcome, the way that I felt in my body in terms of general physical preparedness, I felt more equipped and prepared to handle anything life would throw at me after about two weeks of this experiment than I have felt in a long time. Um, last week, I talked about this knee issue that I had battled in the beginning of the year, and it still nags a little bit. Didn't bother me barely at all during this 30 days of nasal breathing, only during my workouts. I moved slower, more intentional, with more control. And based on my DEXA scan, it did not negatively affect my body composition or anything like that. So another thing that I want to share with you from this book that I thought was super fascinating, makes a lot of sense, but something that doesn't get talked about because probably there's not very much money in it. Uh, and maybe people feel like there's less control over it, even though that's not true, but here's what it is. So there's this uh, Framingham University longitudinal study started in the 80s. And what a longitudinal study is, is a study that lasts for a really long time where they take people and they check in with them like once a year or once every couple of years, depending on the parameters of the study. But they take some bits of data from a big group of people and they track that data over the course of like decades. And then people, researchers can look at that data and they can find the stuff that's relative to what they are researching. So a longitudinal study is just collecting a lot of information from a large group of people. That information can then be used in a lot of different ways. So what James Nestor talks about in this book is that looking at the data from this Framingham study, the greatest indicator of lifespan was not genetics, it was not diet, and it was not the amount of exercise. It was lung capacity. So if you want to talk about fitness or health, depending on how you define those things, look at the highest level athletes right now, the ones that can perform insane amounts of work in an insanely small amount of time. Are those people going to live a really long time? Who knows? Probably not, because if they continue to do what they're doing, their body is going to break down. There is a certain threshold beyond which we cannot just maintain. But lung capacity, so if longevity is a goal, which for me, it really is, I want to extend my life and the quality of my life for as long as possible, not necessarily be able to back squat 400 pounds. 
Lung capacity. One of the best ways to improve lung capacity is breath work. There's different types of breath work, but it starts with just being intentional about your breath. It talks about several different ways to breathe and why they would be cool and interesting and, and useful in this book. And he, even in the back of the book, breaks it down like there's a little section where you can just go and briefly um, recall what the types of breathing were. And there's resources, even like free breathwork classes that are over the internet. So it's really, really cool. But breathing less, breathing better, and yoga. So yoga in the West has become this like exercise thing. And when we think of yoga, we probably think of like, you know, a skinny white person and girl in um, like yoga pants doing some weird acrobatic stuff. But that's not where yoga came from. And no problem if, if that's your jam, you know, and whatever. But the prototypical yogi in the West is maybe not what it started out as. And what a lot of the intent behind yoga is, is breath. And there's certain types of yoga that all it is is breath. All it is is practicing breathing. But a lot of the stretches that we do in yoga are designed to stretch the muscles in between the ribs, to engage the diaphragm in ways that allow us to connect to it better. Um, and create for deeper breaths and maybe not even deeper inhales, but bigger exhales. So practicing breath. There's this idea of CO2 tolerance that I've talked about before. And this might've been back in the Facebook days. I don't remember, but a lot of times we think that, especially when we're working out, oh, I got to get in more oxygen. I got to get in more oxygen. Well, when you breathe in that air, remember what I was talking about, that 21% of the air that's oxygen, and you breathe out, what you breathe out is like 16% oxygen. So it's not that you're not getting enough oxygen. You're getting more than enough oxygen. You're only absorbing four to five percent of of the oxygen in the air that you breathe in and you're breathing out the stuff that you're not using what's interesting is that when you breathe in one percent of the air that you breathe in is carbon dioxide yet when you're breathing out a much larger percentage of what you breathe out is carbon dioxide which means that the processes in your body create carbon dioxide it is a byproduct of these biological processes. So the ability of your body to tolerate CO2 and get rid of CO2 is where the juice is in the breathing. And nasal breathing is a really good place to start with that. There's a hormone called vasopressin that I learned about in this book that I think is really interesting because I hear this a lot, especially when we do challenges, people start upping their water intake and then they feel like they have to get up a bunch during the night to pee. Well, that may not be a hundred percent the case or the reason that you're having to get up in the middle of the night to pee it may not have to do with more water intake. So when you sleep with a pillow, you prop your head up, it can make it harder to breathe through your nose and make it more likely that you breathe through your mouth. And when you breathe through your mouth, um, you're basically you, you have poorer sleep and you can have sleep apnea, uh, snoring issues. That's generally a, a result of mouth breathing while you are sleeping. But when you're sleeping, 
basically your pituitary gland releases this vasopressin. And what that does is it tells your body to store water. And when you have poor sleep and when you're mouth breathing during your sleep, less of that vasopressin is released, which causes your kidneys to release water. And the two things that happen when your kidneys release the water is that it makes it so that you have to pee and it makes you thirsty. So then you drink more water, you go back to sleep, you breathe through your mouth while you're sleeping, your kidneys uh, release more water, then you have to pee again. Uh, and so it's just this like, it's this vicious cycle. The mouth breathing begets more mouth breathing and causes more issues. If you can nasal breathe at night, one of the other things that I've been doing since I read this book was I got rid of my pillow. I've been sleeping without a pillow. I sleep on my back. So I'm able to do that. And since I started doing that, I used to get up every night in the middle of the night and have to pee. And I have not done that. Well, no, I did it one time since I started. Got up in the middle of the night. Usually in the morning, I wake up, my mouth is very dry, I chug water. I still drink water when I wake up in the morning, but I have found that I am less thirsty, my mouth is less dry. And that's all just, the only change that I made in my sleep was breathing through my nose and getting rid of the pillow. So I put myself in a better position, uh, basically set up my airways in a better position to breathe through the nose and to get more out of that. When you breathe through the nose, your um, basically every, all the little hairs in your nose and the sinuses and all of the stuff that exists inside your nasal cavity, they all serve to do different things, but it warms the air, it humidifies the air, it purifies the air so that it makes it more easy to be, easy to be absorbed into the body. Mouth breathing, you don't get any of that. Another cool thing is that the sinuses allow this boost of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is like a vasodilator. It increases circulation. It increases oxygen delivery to the cells. So it can help to lower your blood pressure and increase circulation, which is a good thing. You don't get that with mouth breathing. Um, uh, they did a really cool th experiment in the book where him and his buddy like taped, or they plugged up their noses for 10 days and only breathed through their mouths. They checked their vitals before and after this. And then for another 10 days, they covered their mouths except for when eating or, you know, having to have a conversation or whatever. But they plugged up their, um, covered their mouths and only breathed through their noses check their vitals again before and after. And the results of that were pretty staggering. The health issues that they developed in only 10 days that were not present at the beginning of that experiment were scary. And for most of us, we breathe through our mouths way too much. And I noticed a big difference in just being more intentional with breathing through my nose. Um, it was really hard in the workouts to breathe through my nose. And the first week I felt like I was suffocating. And it wasn't because I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I wanna keep reiterating that. It's because of the CO2. And once I kind of figured out, my body figured out how to tolerate a little bit more CO2 and how to get rid of the CO2 um, and, and be okay with Mentally knowing like, hey, I am getting enough oxygen. I'm okay here. My body's just kind of working this out. Anyways, once I got about a week into it, smooth sailing, it was awesome. A couple of different types of breathing that he talks about in this. There's Tumo breathing, which is like what Wim Hof had kind of repackaged. And it's awesome. And I did that for a long time. And... When I was practicing that, I got to where after about, I want to say seven months of doing it, uh, I could retain a four and a half minute breath hold. 
And at one point I did 80 push-ups in one breath, holding my breath, did 80 push-ups. I was practicing that like pretty religiously and it was taking a long time every morning. But even with um, box breathing, which is talked about in this book, which is something that was developed by the Navy SEALs, and it's you can see the mechanics of it, but it's very simple. I've talked about it on here before. You just breathe in for a count of four, hold it for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, hold it out for a count of four, and you do that for you know a certain number of breaths, four or five breaths, and it will feel very different. To be to give you an example, this morning I was doing some yoga, and um, when I finished. I have my heart rate monitor. My heart rate was like maybe in the 90s when I was practicing. And then I finished and it went down to like the 60s. And I noticed it in the 60s. My, and so I, I turned on my heart rate monitor. I was at 68. I started box breathing for one minute. So that's like, I don't know. But it was probably, it was probably more than like a minute and a half because it was like five box breaths and they're like 16 seconds each. So between a minute and a minute and a half, my heart rate went from 68 to 37. Now my resting heart rate's pretty low. Like I woke up this morning, it was 42. So it dropped, you know, 37 super low. I wouldn't, I don't think that you want to like hang out down there, but with some very deliberate type breathing, I was able to cut my heart rate in half. Drop it from 68 to 37. I don't know if I could keep it down there, but just with a very simple breathing technique to have that kind of control over what should be autonomic, what should be beyond your control, what should be involuntary. We have a lot more control over our bodies, over our uh, nervous system, over our immune system, over our endocrine system, we have a lot more control over that stuff, conscious control, than we think. And if you take anything away from this episode, that should be it. You have a lot more power over the processes in your body than you think, and that power can be accessed through breath. I highly recommend checking out this book. Now, action item. Obviously, I said number one, you should read this book. I endorse it 100%. It's great. But the other thing, if you are into it, try this out for the week. Nasal breathing in your workouts for the week. I'm going to tell you right now, it's very difficult and the intensity of your workout will be governed by your breath. So you have to be on board with that. You have to make a deal with yourself that, hey, I'm not going to get to a place where all of a sudden I can't breathe through my nose anymore and start breathing through my mouth. I am going to stay at a level of intensity at which I can maintain nasal breathing the entire time. Granted, in the first couple workouts, you're probably going to end up mouth breathing. But if you hold yourself to that commitment, keep working on it, keep trying it, by the end of the week, you'll feel really good. I think you'll learn something about yourself. And since I've integrated mouth breathing back into my workouts, when I do get to a really high level of intensity, I've noticed... Um, a really nice balance between being able to still feel good in my body and not completely destroyed, being able to recover better, but also able to maybe bump up that intensity a little bit purely because I like intensity. I think I would be fine if I nasal breathed in my workouts for the rest of my life. I would stay very healthy and I'd probably improve my lung capacity, which is the number one determining factor in longevity. So, hey, that's awesome. Okay, I could talk about this for a long time, but please, let's just have this to be, be the beginning of the conversation. If you have any questions, if you have comments, if you want to talk about the book, I want to hear from you. So check it out. I love you. I will see you next week.